Good morning, Tahiti. How are you? Very good, Ryan. And thank you very much for inviting me to your podcast. I'm, I'm looking forward to this because you have a very interesting background from selling your own business to Cisco to you know having a, a spot at the, at a, as a venture capitalist and giving exposure to tons of companies. And then you've got these this book, and I don't know if your second one is out about the people journey. I, when I watched one of your interviews, you were saying that it was a little bit harder of a, of a book to write than the other one for various reasons. But you get this multidimensional view of business. And for the, for the listeners that are not familiar with your background, why don't you just kind of give us a high level overview, and then we're going to jump into your go to market methodology. So maybe just kind of explain some of the milestones that came up with that, and then we can unpack the, the rest of the story. Yeah, a- absolutely. So uh, it started off that in college, I was an applied math major. And so I just like models and frameworks. And so in my case, I find that I work better if I sort of have a big picture view. And so I, I first started as a, a startup attorney, worked with 200 startups, made a lot of personal investments. And then we started a venture capital firm, Storm Ventures. I'm one of the founding partners there. We now manage over a billion dollars invested in uh, several hundred startups. And also, as you mentioned, I incubated and was the founding CEO of Airspace. So chance to work with a lot of companies and always trying to look for patterns of success and patterns of failure. And uh, that resulted in uh, these books. And the reason why we wrote it is a lot of people helped us in our journey. And so we wanted to sort of help, you know, to help others, just like how we've received help along the way. So and I love how you said that you're the model and big picture guy, because I think the the people that tune in, the listeners, I mean, very, very big picture, they had an idea. And then there's these challenges of hitting ceilings and diff, different challenges where they've got this idea and there's this chasm between what they know it could be and what where they are today. So where were you, Tehi, when you were like, hey, there's a trend here? Because, you know, I'm assuming that with the when you said you're a data and a model guy, what question did you start to pull the thread on that you're like, hey, there's something here where there's a, a framework that we should be able to to uncover? Right. So if I look back at a company that I incubated and started, Airspace, it was uh, the first enterprise Wi-Fi company, and uh, we sold it to Cisco for $450 million. But when we started the company, Wi-Fi was just really starting to hit a critical point. Now it's ubiquitous. But the belief was is is that Wi-Fi uh, uh, wireless access would be something that people want for all their laptops and, and phones. And so I felt like that was an emerging wave. So the first thing we looked at is, you know, is there an emerging wave? And creating your own wave is almost impossible. And so the idea was to sort of see, is there going to be an emerging wave that becomes a big wave that we can then catch and ride? So in you, oh, that's super interesting because I know there's a metaphor about the the surfing that we're going to get into, but how many entrepreneurs have you met or I'm assuming the pitches that you've gotten where they're trying to create their own wave and they don't know it? I would say it's about 10%. I oh, mean, wow. that's, I would say know, that's the reason is, you know, people are only founders generally if they're really passionate about something. And, and, and so... so are the waves obvious to them, Tahi? Because I think when you're talking, and we we were talking about the the theme of the show is unlocking growth, and I and I've mm-hmm. seen a lot of people where they're either they're chasing a wave that is already gone and they haven't caught it, and they're yes. they're trying to chase it and burn cash or burn yes. <laughs> burn their yes. burn their energy, or yes. they're sitting in a calm ocean and they're like, hey, where's this wave? So I think how. What is some of the things that you've identified about how do I how to identify the waves and then what is the process to to capture it? Yeah, so the what's important here is to catch a wave. And, and so the whole idea of catching a wave is to look at in in our case if we're doing like B2B software is to understand sort of uh, the the customer journey. So sort of like what are customers really looking for that would make an an impact in their business and their life. And so by looking at that, you can sort of see uh, the different waves. Uh, in general, the overall waves are pretty obvious. I mean, like, for example, migration to the cloud. I mean, we're like in the third inning of that. Or the other is, you know, we're talking about metaverse becoming something that's going to be more pervasive in our lives. So the overall waves in general are, if you look back at it uh, and, and you gain perspective and talking to people, it, it makes sense. 
The challenge is how do you catch the wave? So let's unpack that. And I don't know if with you, maybe kind of give us a high level overview of the go to market uh, framework right, that right. you guys have created. And then also, you know, with your, with your sale to Cisco, maybe explain and how with aerospace you did it, or maybe you got one of a portfolio companies to kind of highlight the, the example. Yeah, so absolutely. So the challenge here is how do you go from founder led growth? where you've got founders out there closing customers, let's say five, 10 customers, and they can close uh, 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 five to 10 per year. So you can build a base, you can keep growing, but uh, in order to really unlock growth, what you need is a repeatable process whereby you can hire anyone basically, and they could be immediately productive so that you now have something that's repeatable, scalable, and ultimately predictable. And so once you have that as a, a formula, then you can transition from founder-led growth to uh, this repeatable, scalable, predictable growth, uh, uh, growth, which we call go-to-market fit. There are different types of go-to-market models that you see. One could be based on partners, which is how we used at Airspace, going from zero to 100 million. It could be marketing-based, which uh, uh, happened at Marketo. I was on the board of Marketo for 10 years. You know, I invested when there were half a million dollars in revenue, and then later went public, and we sold it for 1.8 billion. It could be product-led growth, like Zenefits or other kind of companies. Uh, Atlassian is a good example of product-led growth. So there are different types of methods. But as you go from founder-led growth to this repeatable growth process, this is where we come up with a, a four-step process on how to do that. So uh, awesome context. And before we get into the four steps, he is... He uh, when one of the videos I was watching of you is explaining the difference between B2B versus B2C and how that mm -hmm. impacts your go-to-market strategy. Why, why don't you cover that a little bit? Because I think that's an important distinction that not a lot of people make and it's and they're wildly different. Right. So in B2B, there are two critical steps before unlocking growth. One is you need happy customers, you know, and, and what that means is you need product market fit and you have customers that stick with you. So that's the first thing is you need product market fit to have that product, uh, happy customers. And uh, the best indicator is a net, it's a retention, looking at your retention rate. But that doesn't mean you've unlocked growth and you can go from 10 customers to 100 customers to 1,000 to 10,000 customers. And you need that repeatable, scalable go-to-market method. And that's what we call go-to-market fit. And so in order to unlock growth in B2B businesses, you need product market fit and you need go-to-market fit. In B2C, though, it's different because in many times, if you have that product market fit and users just love it, then you can get viral growth and just immediately unlock user growth in that manner. So uh, in, in B2C, many times, you, you just need to get that product market fit, whereas in B2B, you need to get both product market fit and go-to-market fit. Well, it's super interesting, too, because I, I have seen over the last, call it five or 10 years, to hear that like a lot of B2C companies and like a lot of advertisers or marketers it, apply what they've learned on you know the scaling of their companies to b2b and a lot of b2b people because they, they gravitate towards what they're saying and it flops miserably because mm -hmm. they they haven't been able to well they can't it's just a completely different thing where someone's you know scrolling through instagram or facebook you know buys a pair of sunglasses or shirts and then it's done versus like the, the component of trust, I think, is so crucial in the B2B, and scaling trust is very difficult. Where, how do you see that fitting into, into the, your, your four steps? No, you're absolutely right, and that's why we created this idea of go-to-market fit is because in B2B, just because you have happy customers and product market fit, uh, we would then invest a lot of money in companies and immediately start scaling. And so we found that going from product market fit to scaling results in disaster, <laughs> high burn <laughs> rates, uh, uh, missed expectations, and then company fail. And that's why we felt it was really important to have that interim step, which we call go to market fit, uh, which is that building that repeatable process uh, so that then as you scale, you can track and see that your go to market is working. So 
going into a little bit of context on your venture capital background and I, like in that analogy you i love the metaphor that you have made the metaphors right where it is the the helicopter the surfing and the multiple surfers because then the, the guy that introduced you on that video he was talking about a lot of vcs and he explains what a lot of people think of vcs and, and then he's like and he's different i was like it was very interesting because then it re related to the story about how you work with the companies and the founders and then how you're applying the the framework so so why don't you just kind of give an overview of the of the surfing analogy or in metaphor? Right. So there are uh, two two parts of that metaphor. One is uh, uh, exactly how a, a CEO unlocks growth, and then the second is how VCs and founder CEOs work together. And so we use the surfing metaphor first as a way of showing how you unlock growth. Is you want to transition from paddling to surfing. Because when you paddle, you burn so much energy to go a short distance, whereas when you surf, you have the wave pushing you. And that's why, as we said, it's so important to catch the wave so that the wave mm -hmm. can push you. And so that's how we want to give people the visual feeling of how to unlock growth is to go from paddling to surfing and become a surfing unicorn. The other perspective where this uh, metaphor helps is to understand how founder CEOs and VCs work together. So we look at the founder CEO as the surfer, sort of on the ride, committed, and the number one goal of the founder CEO, frankly, is just don't wipe out, you know, <laughs> is, is to just keep riding that wave. Whereas as a VC, I'm actually not in the water surfing, but I'm in a helicopter, as you said, about 50 feet above the water, watching like 20 surfers and giving advice and uh, uh, seeing where the wave is coming and directionally where to go. The reason why we came up with these two perspectives is that uh, when my co-author and I wrote uh, uh, the first book of Survival of Thrival, it took us four years. Even though we had worked together on two companies for over 15 years, what we realized is that because of our different roles, we had different perspectives of the same journey. And so we started with dueling chapters, and then over time, we were able to reconcile it in one. And I think that's what makes it more helpful is to combine the surfer perspective and the helicopter into one. And what I find is so uh, relatable to the audience, because regardless of whether you ha someone has a professional investor or not, the, I think the, the metaphor to he works perfectly because a lot of, you know, if people haven't scaled yet, they're the founder and they're, they're the surfer, but they need to still think like the helicopter like you do, which is yes. what is the end result? Creating long-term value is, is so crucial. So that it, whether you have another, you know, formalized relationship, you still need, you still have those roles. So how did you and your partner, what, what was your guys' roles as it working together over the 15 years? Well, so like in Mobile Iron, he was the, the CEO of the company. And I was a chairman of the board and lead investor in the company. And so he excelled at basically surfing, you know, not wiping out, making sure that uh, uh, we were progressing well. And, and that meant, you know, how do you go from zero customers? How do you get your first 10 customers? Then how do you go from 10 to 100 customers, one to 1,000? And when Mobile Arm went public, they had 10,000 customers. So how do you go in that journey to get customers? You know, how do you scale your organization to support it as some of these customers became uh, multi-million dollar accounts? So you need to grow with the customers and all that as well, too, and then uh, build, building out the team and the career. And so it, the company had over thousands, thousands of employees. So you have that entire company journey that uh, the CEO needs to drive. As a board member, though, and a major investor, um, I trusted him completely on day-to-day -day operations and felt he would do that incredibly well. But so now the challenge is, what are sort of the strategic goals that will then drive valuation and then the resulting sort of high-level board metrics that we need to focus on to help the company so, along that journey? I love it. And so going using that metaphor and those two roles, what you know the first step out of the four of the go to market fit is is catching the wave so how how do you translate that into how what are some of the key components to catching that wave 
The, the most important thing in catching the wave is to identify the urgent pain for your ideal customer profile. An urgent pain is answers the question, why buy now? Not six months from now, not 12 months from now, but why buy now? So what I found is, is that in the beginning, as you're trying to catch the wave, is to paddle around the wave until you find that one point of that wave, which is an urgent pain. And then ideal customer profile means you have this sort of uh, uh, standard type, uh, uh, a common type of customers to go after. So the first thing and the most important thing is to identify the urgent pain for your uh, ideal customer profile. And what that gets you is that's how you start working with the customer on the customer journey, okay? It's catching with. And then the question then becomes is as you're working with the customer is what is the end of the customer journey? And many times founders think it's about selling more, it's about getting renewals, it's about making them a million dollar customer. In fact, I think the end of the customer journey is how do you get your champion promoted? You know, this product has been, whatever you're doing has been so strategic and so valuable to the company and to your champion that your champion gets promoted. Uh, a good example is, uh, as I mentioned, I was on the board of Marketo for 10 years. Marketo's first product was uh, basically an email marketing product. It helps you market over email better. In other words, it helps you spam better, you know? <laughs> uh, uh, it's another way of looking at it. Derogatory is a way of looking at it. And the, the, the user was uh, the email marketing manager, okay? But the way Marketo marketed and gave a lot of help to founders, I mean, to uh, people is, how to use this tool to generate pipeline, how to generate demand for sales. So in other words, how can marketing have a seat at the revenue table so that they can actually generate revenue, right? Because that's what CEOs want, is they want more revenue. And, and so Marketo users started developing this new paradigm calling demand generation. So Marketo users became directors, and VPs of demand generation. And next thing you know, CEOs wanted CMOs who could generate pipeline because that's what the VP of sales want. And so the VP mm -hmm. of demand generation became the CMO of a company. So this shows how, you know, Marketo is selling a, a, a marketing software, but more importantly is showing their users and helping them become promoted, become heroes in their organization, and to deliver by delivering great value to the customers. So that's what I look at is, you know, the wave is the customer journey. And what's important is you got to catch it, which is finding that urgent pain, because if you don't, then it just goes right by you. Mm -hmm. And then you have to figure out where you want to ride that wave to in the sunset. And that is, to become strategic to your customer by helping your champion get promoted and becoming a well, hero. I, I love it. And I don't know if you're familiar to he with uh, the story brand, Donald Miller, or there's a bunch of kind of like mm -hmm. the story mm -hmm. selling these days. I mean, what I just heard loud and clear, which is so refreshing is you care about the customer. They want, you want them to be the hero. So like you said, you, you shifted yeah. the conversation away from million dollar customers, you know, reducing attrition and increasing yeah. your ARR to, Hey, there's a person that has a need. They have a job and they have a urgent, reason to buy. Urgent, <laughs> urgent, yeah. urgent, urgent need, urgent need, yes. urgent need. Yes. So fantastic. Well, and so many people forget about that because it, you know, and I interviewed uh, Chris, uh, Chris A, and we were talking about like the amount of like the conversation has just shifted over the last handful of years where everybody's just talking about KPIs and all these things yes. versus like, hey, there are actual people who have urgent yes. needs who have a desire to increase their lives into a better better stage and become a hero. Really, and become a hero. And become yeah. a hero. Yep. Yeah. So awesome. if you can address at this urgent pain and help that person become a hero, you know, you have the foundation of the customer journey, which is understanding it, being able to catch the wave. And there are obviously many steps along the way. And so the, that's why the first step we say is you have to nail your customer journey. Start with what I said is how you start and how you end and every step along the way. And so that's the first step. And if you don't understand the customer journey and, it, and have everyone in the company agree on the customer journey, you have chaos, basically. 
Mm -hmm. You have marketing doing optimizing for marketing. You have sales optimizing for sales, but instead of how to make customers successful in this manner. Then the second step is once you identify, the, nail the customer journey, which is sort of catching the wave, the second is you need to have the right surfboard or the right, we call the right go-to-market playbook. And what that is, is just a simple document, one to two pages most, that helps you understand how to advance your champion along each step of the customer journey. You know? So. So is the surfboard also related to business models? I don't, I don't know where the, like, well, I was going to say, because the, you know, the, once you've nailed the, the urgent need and then the customer profile and then the journey, then trying to figure out like the right surfboard, I think a lot of times the, there's business models that are not conducive to the, the, the journey that you want. So how, where does that fit into to the framework? Yes, uh, it, it, it's... That's a great question. And uh, this framework is focused more on how to unlock growth rather than the question, is this a good business model? Got it. And, and what you say is absolutely right. You need to understand that. Um, so if I were to step back for a second, I'd say that as a board member, there are three fundamental sort of questions. One is, do you, do you have happy customers? Okay. That measures product market fit. Do you have product market fit? And the, the metric there is a, 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 a gross churn or gross retention. The second is, um, have you unlocked growth? In other words, can you grow efficiently? And there the metric is the magic number and it measures your growth efficiency. The third pillar and metric is, do you have a good business model? You know. Your unit economics makes sense. And there, the metric is gross margin. I'll give you an example of where you could have phenomenal customer happiness. So zero churn, phenomenal growth, but a horrible business model. And that is if you sold dollar bills for 80 cents. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly just right? that simple, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. The first two metrics will be unbelievable. It'll be off the charts. <laughs> But obviously, the third would doom the business. And so it turns out you need these three metrics. And with these three metrics, you can build your entire financial model. So let's, uh, I'd love to hear your example of comparing two different types of surfboards, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe some of your portfolio companies or an aerospace that you, that you were in. Like, what would be like a couple of good examples of different types of surfboards? Right. So you could have a surfboard, which is, let's say, a sales-led go-to-market, or you could have a, a, a surfboard, which is a, a product-led go-to-market, okay? And, and how do you uh, figure out which one's... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, how do you sorry, figure, like, while you're going through that, is how do, you, how do you figure out which one's the right one? Is there, like... And how do, you, how do you determine you're on the right surfboard? Right. So it goes back to two things. One is understanding the customer journey. And then the second is uh, your product. So um, in this customer, in the playbook you have for the customer journey, one key question is uh, when will your customer realize first real value? Mm. You know, if that happens, like, uh, so, you know, think about yourself, you know, you buy something and you sort of say, when do I get real value out of this? Not all the value, but the first value go, why, this is cool. I'm going to keep using it, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that moment, which we call first value. And the question is, when does that first value happen? If it happens like one year after you bought, you signed the contract, you know, there's some products which just take a long time to deploy, right? Mm -hmm. Onboarding takes time. You got to customize it. You got to do all this stuff before you can actually really start using it. And so if it takes like a, a, a year to uh, deploy uh, before you get first value, it's got to be a sales-led type of product-led won't work. Whereas if you can realize that first value very early on, I mean, the best thing is I've got an urgent pain. Mm -hmm. And then I Google or find some way of I looking for who else has this urgent pain or how do I solve this urgent pain? I see an ad 
or I uh, see a, a, a customer testimonial, or I read something online, uh, or a friend of mine tells me about it, and I look at it and I go, wow, this is cool. And then if I can click a button, and then immediately I go, it relieves my urge and pain before I even buy it, that is like really cool, right? Mm -hmm. I just described product-led growth to you. Then you, product-led growth can work. So fascinating. I love that. But, but that it point. comes down to, yeah, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, what I, what I like about it, is that, like, well, I know I'm, I want some more clarification or your thoughts on, like, so if you have an urgent need and it takes a year to deploy, explain why that would be a sales-led go-to-market. Because you have to persuade the customer that, uh, you know, uh, that this is going to work. There's just a lot of explaining to do. Versus, I've got this pain, I click on it, it's gone. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, it's, it's so fascinating because I don't know, I can't think of too many people that have gone through that exercise to determine whether their go-to-market strategy is the right one, you know, based on like the level of yes. trust and the timeline. I mean, it's very interesting shift in understanding like you know how urgent is it and do you need you know that, that's maybe that's where going back to an earlier comment is trust i mean the salesperson's leveraging trust that they're building because they have someone has to trust that after a year of deployment and maybe hundreds you need of a lot of, of trust <laughs> yeah you need a lot <laughs> yeah. of trust right if it's a year whereas if they can just click on it and it solves the urgent pain even before they pay anything you need less trust mm -hmm. and what was the third one you said it was it um was it just marketing? Go to yeah, it? marketing led, and it's more about education. You know, understand, explain, and, and it's a way of building trust through edu thought leadership. Basically, is there is there a combination of these that work? A absolutely, a absolutely. Uh, I can tell you, like one very good go to market is uh, if you can, is you land with product led and you expand with sales led. Mm -hmm. So you get in a large company, you get a team or an engineer to click on it, solve it, start using it. You might even get five, because it's a large company, you could even get five engineers and different teams to start using it. And then mm -hmm. you, your sales team then has this data, you know what people are doing, and then mm -hmm. you can go in and now you're going in and not sort of just saying, theoretically, this is what you can do. You can say, well, these are your engineers doing this. Mm -hmm. And this is a way that you can make this enterprise wide. So you had mentioned with aerospace that you, was it partner led that you yes. had said? That, yes. So how does that fit into, maybe give that example too, because I think there's an interesting decision that a lot of people, I mean, this is great, great framework for how people think about going to market and whether it's partner, like partners is a one to many. I also think about it in our current yes. business and also some of our clients, is it one to many, is it one to one? And how, how does that impact it? Explain how the partnership or partner led when uh, with aerospace and how you guys scaled using that. Yes. So b basically, uh, uh, aerospace was the first uh, one of the first uh, enterprise uh, Wi-Fi solutions, and so we made the bet that there will be a wave for enterprise Wi-Fi when laptops all get Wi-Fi enabled. Okay. And, and so at that point, enterprises will need a, 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 a Wi-Fi system within the companies, okay? At that time, there was also a dominant company called Cisco was the dominant company in the enterprise networking space. And so the question is, is as people recognize that this is an urgent pain for enterprises all around the world, how can we fit this urgent need urgent pain uh, against our competitor, Cisco, who dominates all the channels. And as a startup, we can't like sell, you know, build a sales organization worldwide. And so what we did is uh, uh, we signed up three OEM partners uh, in addition to our building our internal set direct sales team. And so we had a, a Japanese partner, NEC, that obviously has a lot of good relationships in uh, Japan. Mm -hmm. And so they could go and say, hey, don't wait for Cisco. Because Cisco didn't have the product, but Cisco was saying, wait for me. You can say, look, <laughs> buy this and you know, to their existing customers, and then this gives you a Wi-Fi solution right now. In uh, uh, Europe, we signed up Alcatel as an OEM partner. 
and same thing. And then the United States at that time, uh, North America, we signed up Nortel. So we had these three major OEM partners, and what we were able to do was immediately Wi-Fi enable their existing customers. So, so fascinating. And that's, that's where you like talk about exponential growth. How do you... Yes. And I've I've had other um, examples I've come across where they're they're doing the channel partner distribution. Our old business was like that too. We were a value added reseller, office equipment and mm -hmm. software, et cetera. So we were, you know, the people probably were well, we were working with those carriers that you were talking about. And then mm -hmm. it was a, just another yes. partner, yes. another layer in. How does the timeline impact the partnership strategy? Because like so if it's an urgent need and I need to see the value soon, how did like or is it longer? How did, how does the timeline impact? The partner uh, strategy? Partner strategies take a, usually a very long time to develop, you know, because you got to find partners, you have to train partners, you have to incentivize partners, all that kind of stuff. Okay. So partners and, you know, partners have other, it's hard enough to control your own sales force. <laughs> That's why I was wondering. Someone yeah. else's sales force. Okay. <laughs> Yep. Right. So uh, uh, signing up a partner doesn't automatically just achieve success, okay? So it turns out, though, there is a simple solution to uh, uh, success with partners, and that is addressing an urgent pain. If customers are going to the partners and say, I've got this urgent pain, I got to solve it, I need something now, and the partner has something, then lo and behold, you get satisfaction and you get growth. That's what happened with Airspace. It will in because if the urgent need is there and they're going to that partner, then the, the trust is already built with the partner too. Exactly. So exactly. So the VAR or the partner OEM has mm -hmm. that trusted relationship. So mm -hmm. it gets the first call. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if they don't have the solution, well, and the customer still has an urgent pain, he's going to go, or she is going to go to the next and the next, mm -hmm. which ultimately may just be surfing the web. <laughs> what, what, what are the pitfalls in these different surfboards? I mean, and, and what, how do you, what are the ways to spot that you might be on the wrong surfboard? It, it's really is to look at the surfboards got to match the wave, right? You know? Big waves require longer boards. Smaller waves require shorter boards. So the wave, the the board matches the wave. In the same way, your go-to-market playbook has to match your customer journey. I love it. It's just, it's it's such an easy easy metaphor to 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 lean into. So now we're riding the wave, right? I don't know if we're jumping right. too fast. Right, right. No, no, that's <laughs> the third. Yes, yeah. It's, you got to ride the wave and you know not fall <laughs> yeah, off. Yeah, ride it. Yeah, don't wipe out, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, what are the ways to ride? What are the different components of riding a wave and making sure that you don't wipe out? Yeah. So, you know, once you have this, uh, you know, the customer journey, you got your playbook. The next thing is you have to figure out who does what. And that's what the key to riding the wave is, is sort of operationalizing that playbook. So, you know, you've broken down the customer journey and the playbook into stages. And so who owns what, like what does marketing own, what does sales own, and just making sure that you have uh, the ownership of these stages that's clearly defined in the team. And then the next thing is to do the, the handoffs between like marketing and sales or product and sales. And uh, um, it, it's really important. So I'll, I'll give you an example of the marketing to sales handoff. Um, so when I go to board meetings, you know, and the VP of marketing goes up to present, uh, you know, I'll hear so many metrics, you know, uh, MQLs, you know, um, meetings, conversions, uh, uh, all this kind of stuff, slide after slide. In, in my mind, and I tell them, what I'm really interested in marketing is understanding the handoff from marketing to sales. So in other words, how much new pipeline has marketing created for sales? That's quantity. The second is, I want to know the quality. Is, is that new pipeline converting? And then the third is, uh, uh, the efficiency is, what's the, the cost of each uh, new lead or the pipeline we're generating? And so really focusing on that uh, uh, handoff between marketing and sales. And what I've seen is, and, and I, it's a simple cohort analysis that I like to see. And, and what you get out of this is, I, I know one of my companies, 
the company changed their marketing message and got a huge uptick in leads. And so that's good. You know, you're generating more pipeline as, you know, we uh, 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 went with a broader, a bigger marketing message. So we got a lot of leads, but it turned out we were getting these leads, which uh, uh, our sales team and product were not yet suited to close. So mm -hmm. our conversion went, went down significantly because we had a mismatch between marketing and sales and product. And, and so riding the wave, the most important thing is to realize that go to market is ultimately a cross-functional activity. You can't just mm -hmm. hold the VP of sales accountable. You can't hold the VP of marketing accountable or the VP of product. It's truly a cross-functional activity that the CEO has to manage. And then the, just, just for your clarification, because I've, I've loved asking this question over the last years, your, what is your definition of marketing versus sales? Marketing is, well, they, marketing is, is, so sales I view as closing the deal, okay? It's closing the deal. Marketing is, is that they do brand, branding, and also about getting uh, leads. It's sort so of the top it, of the it, funnel. It, it, Right. And like, and I've been, I, I've, I've used it in the past because I've had a couple of uh, marketers and, and sales uh, gurus on recently. And like, it's interesting because it all kind of swirls together because it's all one customer journey. Like you've already identified urgent pain and then yeah. build the trust. And yeah, like, the, the, it's the like customers really... don't care whether it's marketing or sales. Yeah. <laughs> and they're just like, they're learning and getting exposure to the brand. It's more just, is there a human being involved that's custom, like having a custom conversation is just my definition of sales. And then it go, is going from there to close it. But um, yes. So you can have like some people view marketing as automating sales, mm -hmm. but, but I, you know, marketing has sort of different functions. So one is in terms of the pipeline, this that we are talking about, it's definitely at the top of the funnel you know, driving awareness, driving interest, and ultimately getting leads, you know, which is building mm -hmm. pipeline. So building pipeline, but, you know, marketing is also doing brand, which is different than just driving leads. And then mm -hmm. uh, um, um, the, the, the third is uh, uh, sometimes is, you know, there could be a lot of product marketing. Well, I think it's just interesting is just having the consistency all the way through that that journey and, and yes. going back to one of your earlier comments about sustainable and predictable processes on this what mm -hmm. do you, how do you get out of the founder led relationships and like you know, like you were talking about the 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 wrangling to the ground and let's say you chose one of the surfboards mm -hmm. what 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 have you, what have you seen as successful strategies or the opposite of unsuccessful of getting in? Yeah. So the first thing I look at is, is let's say it's a founder led sales. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is to see if uh, you can have five productive sales reps, you know, mm -hmm. so five productive uh, non founder sales reps that are make, making quota. Mm -hmm. Just that simple as in like, Hey, someone's able to take your story and you've standardized the story and the messaging and someone else is telling it just that. simple. Yeah. It, it's really making it simple. Yeah. Founders can sell it. almost anything to anyone. <laughs> uh, sometimes, yeah, sometimes it's just the idea and it just never stops after just the idea. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> and and uh, the, whereas mere mortals, you know, have, and that's why I said an urgent pain for an ideal customer profile. The you ever ideal seen customer any... profile is important to make it repeatable. Mm-hmm. It, what, do you see any issues once it goes from sales and marketing into actual the the service? And Absolutely, like where see a lot of. It's problems, got a huge, yeah. huge like yeah. my, where the my business partner calls it, where you put out a box on a conveyor belt. Eventually, it'll drop off, but you put in more boxes on the conveyor belt. But you want to reduce the friction to getting those boxes on the conveyor conveyor belt. Yeah, I mean, if you look, and that's why it's so important to look at the customer journey, and then to say these are the stages and who's responsible for each. So it's generally marketing, sales, customer success, and then sales for upsells and expands, okay? Mm -hmm. it, it's sort of, if you look at the journey, that's typically how the stages are broken up into those sort of four groups. Mm -hmm. But then underlying all this is product. So then 
we're going on to improving the ride. I don't know if that's what you're already kind of ch yes. touching on. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Just so making sure you're part, still going. Yeah. So once you're riding, you know, you're riding the wave, the next is how do you improve it? And it's all about metrics and then how, kind of making sure that, you know, you have the right metrics um, so that you can continue to improve the execution. So using the metaphor and the entrepreneur is the, the surfer and you're riding these waves, every wave mm -hmm. comes to a, a stop at some point. And mm -hmm. that stop is some valuation or exit at some point. How, you know, with all your portfolio companies and, and your personal experience in, in airspace, like where do you, how do you predict or how do you, how have you kind of envisioned the wave coming to a, to a complete, like how do you assess where you're at in the life stage of that wave and where the end result might go in order to regroup and get another wave? Right. So, you know, to the extent that the companies uh, can keep identifying the next wave or maneuver to the part of the wave, which is the biggest part of the wave, then uh, you, you have a company that really is on a, a, a major growth path. Like, you know, one of our companies is TalkDesk. You know, uh, TalkDesk close to financing at $10 billion. They're the leading call center software company. And we were an early investor in the company. And so this is a company that first started off with SMBs and then moved up to mid-market and then moved to enterprise. Um, and now it's going beyond just basic call center service to add intelligence, to add become a platform. So it, it's starting at one part of the wave where there was the most urgency because, you know, you have a startup that wants a, a, a three-person call center immediately at, with the cheapest solution, and that's what TalkDesk provided. So starting with that urgent pain, they've now been able to paddle on where there are now a couple hundred million dollar companies sort of going down and growing this wave. And the call center software market is like a $20 billion market. So you, you can maneuver on this to, you know, get onto a, a bigger wave. So that's an example of a company that's gone through this uh, transformation very well. We obviously have companies that have either missed catching a wave or, <laughs> or, or, or missed the next wave. Um, and so in those cases, you know, we uh, uh, look for exits, obviously. And how do you, as the helicopter and you know, putting your VC hat on it, when when's the appropriate time to come in and make sure that the surf the surfers on track using the right like how what's your relationship and how does how do you typically insert yourself or your conversations or your relationships uh, and how, what, what's that dynamic look like well it's really important to sort of build trust and respect so the first thing is to build trust and respect and uh, um uh, and i find the best way to do that is to really understand their business from their eyes because it's easy in the helicopter to say, do this, do that. It's another to actually do it while you're trying not to wipe out in the middle of this big wave, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, Tehi, how many times do you run into or the, the situation where the surfer just loves surfing and they're having, they're, they're, they're focused on enjoyment and they, there's this baby of theirs, which is their wave versus looking at the process of where they're at and the fact that they're a surfer, not just attached to this one wave. You know, it, it happens like that sometimes. And, uh, uh, you know, the way I look at it is, at the end of the day, if we're still going to make money on the deal, then we may not make as much money as we should, but we should be thankful that we're, you know, going to be on a successful ride. I, I mean, if they're going to wipe out, then that's different. <laughs> yeah, because then it's a zero for everyone. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, so when you, how many companies, an average, do you have an investment in at this point? Um, we have uh, sixty active investments right now. What's your favorite? What's your favorite part about your job and what you're doing? You know, the my favorite part is seeing a, a person become a great surfer. You know. That that's the, the the best part, you know. You start working with someone, and you could tell that they it's just all this is so new, and then over time they become a phenomenal surfer. 
Is there is there a great is there one of uh, your favorite stories out of all the companies you had investments in or the ones that you've been you, well you just like talk to us you know the CEO Tiago I think he was 24 years old when he started talk desk no way I think this was his first job <laughs> that's awesome not think, too yeah, shabby he hit the wave company. yeah what were I don't know if we got enough time but maybe a couple cliff notes of like of the four steps like maybe give some highlights of like, you know, what was the um, urgent need in the customer profile and then the paddle? I don't know if you want to, if we got enough time for that, but I'm just curious on how you apply the four steps to, to that success story. Yeah. So for TalkDesk, they, he really caught the wave, which is uh, uh, you, there are all these venture back startups getting, uh, uh, you know, or, or, you know, coming out of like Y Combinator, all these companies are getting started and they're looking for the simplest, cheapest call center. So you just want to hire a couple of agents then and then just use the cloud and just get a, a call center working. And so he, that was the, uh, the urgent pain that he was able to address and sort of catch that wave. But, you know, if you just focus on venture-backed startups, you know, that's, that's not the biggest market, you know. And so he was then able to migrate uh, um, uh, up to like a large enterprise as well, but it takes time. So what was, it was his idea? So is that where it was more of like improve the wave? So the improve the wave has moved from like a three person need to a bigger scale. Like, so the customer yes, profile yes, changed yes. over time. Yeah. So the, the metaphor we're using here is how to unlock growth. And once you unlock growth, then there are other things that can do to really to scale. But what focusing on here is the stage between product market fit, where you've got some happy customers, and usually with founder-led growth, but you've got product market fit with founder-led growth, and before scaling is finding go-to-market fit to unlock growth. And once you can do that, then you can start scaling. And, and part of scaling is to move up market and other aspects. What was their uh, what was the surfboard that they chose chose to wave? Was it product led or was it partner or sales led? What was the um, it, it was, a, was a marketing board? and inside sales? Yeah, yeah. So any the, the for for existing companies that are out there that are not you know at the idea stage, you know, let's say they've been paddling for ten years. <laughs> Is there? I mean, all the all the same stuff applies. I mean, anything? Oh, absolutely. I, I think you know. Uh, um, if you've been paddling for 10 years, you've got to have some happy customers, right? Because, you know, you, you, you're not going to be around if you have zero customers for 10 years. Uh, it's hard to get investor funding like that for 10 years. So, um, you know, you've got happy customers, and it's really to step back and trying to identify that wave around you that you can catch. And that's why I think it's important to look at your customers and try to see what can make them what has made them a hero or what you can do to make them a hero on one end. And then the other is to look for that urgent pain. I don't know if you've come across any stories where there was like the, the founder who had, you know, positive cash flow, been paddling for 10 years. When they go through an exercise like this, I'm assuming people are already thinking about their business and their, and their market and their customers different. You know, it, is it, I, I can I can only imagine that if I if I went through an exercise like that, you it becomes obvious whether you need to raise funds and you're like, hey, I like the the opportunity is there if we want to actually truly ride this or you know ride this wave. I mean, where does the 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 funding behind this? I mean, how many times to hit this hyper growth? I mean, you you got to be raising funds because I'm 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 assuming I, there's probably not a lot of companies that can use their own cash flow to or very little cash flow to be able to do this. Is that pretty much am I, am I on track with that or yeah I mean the way of looking at it is is uh, uh, you might with cash flow break even grow at 20 percent per year okay so you know reasonable growth and let's say your cash flow break even so by being mm -hmm. cash flow break even you, you grow at 20 percent per year the question is is if you get external funding and you incur a loss, can you grow number one a hundred percent per year? Because if you only grow from go from twenty to thirty percent, it's like why go through all this hassle? 
you know, mm -hmm. give up control and all that when you only uh, can grow. But can you go to 100%? And then the next question is, well, is it a, if an efficient way of going from 20 to 100% or is it just so inefficient that you're burning a huge amount? But it, if it turns out you can go in a capital efficient way from 20 to 100% growth, then uh, it definitely takes, it makes sense to get funding and go for it. So what's your favorite part about it, it, watching pitches or ideas? And then when can you tell that someone has this concept of, the, of your go-to-market fit and these four steps in the right framework? I mean, like, is it pretty obvious to you that someone's gone through the work or like how... I'm just curious, like when you're when you're seeing all these, I'm assuming it's hundreds. Uh, yeah, I mean, whether they use these four steps or not are not, you know, is not something I'm trying to hold founders to. Um, mm -hmm. But if they don't have certain elements of it, I know it's going to be hard. Is it is it obvious for you to spot that? Like if if they don't have if none of their customers are here, none of their champions are heroes then it's probably not going to be a strategic product, mm -hmm. you know, or it, if they don't address an urgent pain, then it's probably not going to take off. This has been so fun. I, I think the, it, you've, you've given me different ways to even think about our business. <laughs> so it's uh it's fantastic. It, you know, there's two questions, Tehi, that I like to ask everybody at the end of the uh, show. The first one is their definition of intentional because it's the name of the show and it's a word that I, uh, I like more every day. What is your definition of the word intentional? Intentional is just something uh, a person planned for or wants. Yeah. Thought through. Second question is, where do we find more about you and the go-to-market fit and all the, I mean, you got a lot of content out there. Where's the best place to reach you? Uh, the best way to reach me is through LinkedIn. So I respond to LinkedIn messages. Um, and the best way to read the, the, the content actually is, is on the website, which we do for free, uh, which is at survivalthrival.com. And there's a lot of content out there for the listeners. So if you want more about this, there's, they did not skimp out on that. So thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. And great questions. Thank you very much. Talk to you later.